Thank you, Brother Eric. Good morning to everyone who's here and to those who are tuning in live on Facebook or who will be watching this at another time. We are in uh, Mark chapter 14, and we are uh, starting from verse 1, and we will be covering verse 1 through 11 this morning. The title of today's sermon is A Deep Love for Christ. Let me ask you a question that I hope you will be brutally honest in answering, and answer it to yourself. You don't have to obviously say it out loud or anything like that. Have you in your life as a follower of King Jesus ever made a sacrifice of extravagant love? Can you recall a time when you did something that really cost you? You actually went without something you really wanted because of a sacrifice of extravagant love for Jesus. And that's something that we got to ponder, we got to think about in our Christian life. Are we following Jesus as a disciple in a sacrificial way that we don't do the things we really would want to do and we sacrifice that for the love that we have for Jesus Christ our Savior, but also our Lord. The sad fact is that, 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 is that we are good at giving Jesus our leftovers and hand-me-downs. You know, we'll go throughout our day working, family, gym, whatever the case may be, errands, and then we'll give God a little time at the end of the day for just maybe some scripture, maybe a little prayer. But throughout the whole day, we sometimes don't think about God. We don't pray with God. We don't worship God. We, uh, we make that. We don't have time because we're really busy, right? And um, it shouldn't be that way. God should be first in our lives in everything that we do. And we're going to see as we read this scripture today... Two distinctions between two people, one who sacrificially loved Jesus and the other who didn't and actually betrayed Jesus. In Mark chapter 14, 1 through 11, we see something all altogether different, something truly remarkable, an indisputable sacrifice of extravagant love by a woman Mark allows to remain anonymous. And we also see the, the tell of two lives that could not stand in greater contrast when it comes to true and unreserved devotion to our Lord, an unnamed woman who gave her very best, and a man named Judas who betrayed the Son of God. Of the woman, Jesus said, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her verse 9 and of the man Judas our Lord said it would have been better for that man if he had not been born verse 21 so if you're able please stand for the reading of God's word we are in Mark chapter 14 we're going to read the first 11 verses it was two days before the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread the chief priests and the scribes were looking for a cunning way to arrest Jesus and kill him. Not during the festival, they said, so that they, there won't be a riot among the people. While he was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at the table, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured it on his head. But some were expressing indignation to one another. Why has this perfume been wasted? For this perfume might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they began to scold her. Jesus replied, leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? <coughs> she has done a noble thing for me. You always, you, will, you always have the poor with you and you can do what is good for them whenever you want. 
but you do not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body in advance for burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. And when they had heard this, they were glad and promised to give him money. So he started looking for a good opportunity to betray him. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning asking you to bless your word, to speak to us this morning, Lord, that we would have a love for you, uh, an extravagant love. Lord, that we would um, not be like Judas, Lord, being betrayal, a betrayer, that we would give and love and seek and, and serve you sacrificially, Lord. Help us, Lord, to put in practice your word this morning, Lord, that we, you may speak to us. And if we have something to repent about, that we would, and that we would seek to continue, Lord, to uh, love you with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So four truths emerge from our text. As we look at this text, now what we look at, what does extravagant, sacrificial love look like? Point one, sacrificial, extravagant acts of love will be public. And we see that in the first three verses of chapter 14. The backdrop of this story is the Jewish feast of Passover and unleavened bread, verse 1. This celebration took place annually and was observed in Jerusalem. It was a time of remembrance and thanksgiving for God's miraculous deliverance of the Hebrews from Egyptian bondage through the Exodus. And we see that in Exodus chapter 12. The Jewish 4th of July included the slaughter of the Passover lamb whose blood was put on the doorstep and had caused 1,400 years earlier, the death angel to pass over each home where he saw the blood sparing the life of the firstborn in the family. Jewish persons were flocking to Jerusalem to celebrate, but in the shadows of the secrecy of the Sanhedrin, the chief priests and scribes, they were seeking to arrest Jesus and kill him. So in the midst of a celebration and something good to remember upon of what God had done, for the people of Israel, for the Hebrews, the, the chief priests and the scribes, they're scheming evil things to do. They're trying to arrest and to kill Jesus. Mark says they hope to arrest him by stealth, some sly way. But they felt they must wait until after the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. In verse 2 it says, we don't want the crowds up in arms. They care about what the public thinks. They're so caught up on what is everybody going to do and think if we do something. They knew Jesus was popular with the people and therefore they would wait until the crowds had gone. However, things were proceeding on God's timetable, not theirs. And Christ, the Passover lamb, would be sacrificed for us right on time when God had determined because God is sovereign, and things happen when God wants them to happen, not when man or humans decide that they want to do something. Suddenly, the, the scene shifts in verse 3 to a home in Bethany of a man named Simon. And Jesus apparently had healed him from leprosy. We see that, and we read it in the text. Matthew 26, 6 through 13, and John chapter 12, 1 through 8 also records this story. John chapter 12 verse 1 tells us of the event happened six days before the Passover. So Mark's account is something of a flashback. He's looking back on this event here. John's gospel also informs us that the lady who anointed both Jesus' head, which we see in Mark chapter 14 verse 3, and feet in John chapter 12 verse 3, was Mary the sister of Martha and Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead in John chapter 12, verse 2. Some have surmised that Simon may have been their father. As Jesus was reclining at the table in verse 3, Mary came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly, is expensive, and she broke the flask and poured it over the head of Jesus. 
The unadulterated un nard was a sweet smelling perfume. Just imagine a fragrance that smells so good. From a rare plant found only in India, she broke the flask, making it no longer usable, and poured its full content on Jesus, both on his head and his feet, which she wiped with her hair. It says in John chapter 12, verse 3. It is interesting to note that each of the three times we see Mary in the gospel, she is at the feet of Jesus. Luke chapter 10, 39, John chapter 11, 32, and chapter 12, verse 3. Jesus had Mary at his feet. This was done in full display of a room full of people. The room was full of people and she's doing it in front of everyone, the public, the crowd. You see a distinction between the chief priests and the scribes? How they think what people, they, they're worried. What will people think? And obviously they're doing something evil. Mary's not doing something. She's doing something good, but she doesn't care what the people might think of what she's doing. Because it was done in public. It was done against cultural convention. As a woman normally would not approach a man in this setting except to serve him food. Mary cared not one whit for any of this. Jesus was her Lord and Master. She deeply loved him and would have done anything for him. And she did not care who heard or who saw. Her devotion to him trumped all others. She wanted everyone to know the inestimable value she placed on Jesus. So she went public. No one could deny or doubt where her loyalty lay. Can the same be said for you and for me? If we ask ourselves, are we like that? Are we like Mary? Is Jesus our Lord and our Master? Or is He just our Savior? Sometimes Jesus is just our Savior. Our get out of hell free card. Our, you know, I got a flu shot. I done did that. I accepted Jesus as my, as my Savior. But are we living in submission to Him as Lord and as Master? Do we obey His commandments? Questions we should be asking. Do we sacrificially serve Him first and foremost and then we serve the people around us? Do we have a deep love for Jesus? Would we do anything for Jesus? If he asks us to do something for him, would we do it? Or would we disobey and do something different? Do we care who sees or who hears when we're with Jesus? How is our devotion to him? Or are we ashamed? Sometimes we, we can be ashamed of Jesus and his words. And we don't want to offend people and we don't want to we want to be we don't want to offend with the words of what the word of God says with the people around us, our family, our friends, our co-workers because we're sensitive and they're sensitive and we just don't want to rock the boat. But if God's word says something that is true we've got to affirm it and we've got to speak it. The fact is, people might say, well, I'm a good person. I'm good. But the Bible says otherwise. The Bible says that no one is good, not even one. We're all sinners. We've all broken God's commandments. And when we evangelize and we share the gospel with family, friends, co-workers, people around us, we got to be straightforward with them. we got to let them know that even though they think they're good, they're not good. They've broken God's commandments. They're in rebellion against God, a holy, righteous, just God. And they might be uncomfortable when you have that conversation with them. And I, again, all of this is done out of love because we care about them because if they die in their sins, they will go to hell and perish. And we want them to repent. We want them to put their faith and trust in Jesus as their Lord and as their Savior. So let us not be ashamed. Let us not be unapologetic about what the Word of God says. And let us be bold, not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God unto salvation for those who believe. So let us be able to share that message of hope and good news with those who desperately need to hear it.
But before the good news is shared, you got to share the bad news, which is they broke in God's commandments and they're rebelling against God and they need to repent. So extravagant acts of love will be criticized. The woman's act of astonishing radical devotion did not go unnoticed. It, it also did not go without significant criticism. The critics would have no part in praising what this woman had done. Mark informs us that some began to talk amongst themselves and they were indignant, verse four, verse 4. They were indignant. They swelled up in anger, nearly busting with indignation over her. They were upset. They were, what is she doing? They weren't happy about what she was doing. Led by Judas, in John chapter 12, verse 4, and in self-righteous pride, they questioned both her motive and her action. Why was this ointment wasted like that? They're asking. For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii, which is a year's salary. Imagine that. Think about this. You work all year, and then you give it to Jesus. Imagine your whole, just think about your whole salary and what you make in a whole year. If you were to give that to Jesus, I mean, obviously you got to live, pay bills and eat and all that. But that's how what, 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 she sat, what she gave to Jesus would have cost. And given to the poor. So they say, rather than give it to Jesus, let's give it to the poor. And they scolded her. They continually expressed their anger and displeasure, snorting at her. They didn't find that right. In their eyes, that wasn't right. Several important observations can be made at this point. One, <coughs> the disciples not only demeaned the woman, they also demeaned Jesus. How? How is that, how, how is that even possible? What did they do? To honor Christ in this manner, they said, was a waste. Verse 4. They did not believe he was worthy of such a sacrifice of extravagant love. Some are willing, number two, some are willing to be poor in their possessions in order to be rich in their devotion to Jesus. Hear that again. Some are willing to be poor in their possessions in order to be rich in their devotion to Jesus. Others are not. And it is the latter group that are usually the critics. It is those <coughs> who don't sacrifice, who don't give it all for Jesus, that are always criticizing those who do. Man, you are so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. Man, you go to church too much. Man, you talk about God too much. Man, you read the Bible too much. What's wrong with you? Are you a religious fanatic? Have you not heard that before from some people around you? Why are you always in Bible studies? Why are you always talking about Jesus and God and this and that? And why? Because they don't have a love and a devotion for Jesus. For them, it's a waste. But let's analyze our own lives. And this, and during this time, during this time, um, we have a lot of time to think and reflect at our houses when we're not working, when we're with our family, our wife, our kids, our siblings, our parents, our grandparents. We have time because we're not occupied in the busyness of life. We have let's kind of like slow down, and we have time to reflect about how we are living our lives, about how we are in our relationship with God, our Creator, our Father, our Maker. Again, some are willing to be poor in their possessions, just giving. Remember, storing up treasures in heaven where moth and wrath do not destroy, then laying up treasures here on earth where it will be gone, it will perish in order to be rich in their devotion to Jesus. We want to be rich in our devotion to Jesus. The world, and sadly many in the church, will never have a problem with moderate, measured devotion to Christ. 
They'll never have a problem with that. They will have little or no problem with too many possessions. Let's buy a house, not only one house, two, three, four, five houses, have five, six cars, have uh, thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars in our, in our, in our savings account. Um, they just have many possessions, toys, boats, whatever you know we like to do, we have um, clothes, jewelry. Let's have many possessions. They have no, no problem. If you have that, if you're doing that, you're doing the right thing, right? America says you're doing the right thing. People say you're good. You're, you're doing well for yourself. Too much wealth and a pursuit of a comfortable and convenient Christianity. Because that's what we get accustomed to in this culture that we live in, in this world that we live in. Who can get the most? Who can store the most possessions and wealth? But that's even in the church. Outside the church, it's definitely, but even in the church, it's crept inside. But, but, listen to this. Listen to this. But walk away from a real career. Walk away from a real career in athletics, in business, in medicine, in law, or real estate, and you will be marked as foolishness, living a wasted life. Walk away from mom and dad and serve the Lord in an inner city in America among the poor and hurting and you will be deemed foolish and impractical. Walk away from family and friends and head out to a mission field among an unreached people group Take, taking your small children with you and you'll be chided as foolish, radical and even imbalanced in need of serious counseling and maybe even drugs, medical drugs. Yes, you may be criticized here but in heaven you have a master who applauds your love and devotion for him. Paul puts it in perspective. Does he not in Galatians 1.10? Let's go to Galatians 1.10. Galatians 1.10 says, For am I not trying to persuade people for, or God? Or am I tr striving to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. So what are we doing, you guys? What are we doing? Are we trying to be people pleasers? Are we trying to make everybody think good of us? People around us? Our family, friends, acquaintances, neighbors, whoever we're interacting with. Are we trying to please them or are we trying to please God? And be, as Paul says, a servant of Christ. What are we trying to do? Because sometimes I think in Christianity, in our church, we make it the bar low. I mean, obviously salvation is a free gift of God. You don't earn it. There's nothing you can do. You just receive it. God transforms you, gives you a heart of, fle a heart of rock, and puts a heart of flesh, and regenerates you, makes you be born again. It is a work of God, not as, not as, not as you doing it. And salvation is a free gift. We get that. But being a disciple, a follower of Christ, entails sacrifice. It entails what are you giving up in your life to follow Jesus Christ? Because sometimes we want to bring all our worldly baggage and possessions, but we also want Jesus and we want it all. And Jesus is just a, another extra little ornament that we put in our pockets and that is with us. But is he everything to us? Is he primary to us? Are we willing to give it all for Christ if he were to ask us to do so? And that is the question we got to ask. And only you and God know the answer. George Whitfield, an evangelist of the first great awakening, said, Oh, for a thousand lives to be spent in service for Christ. However, we must never forget we only get one. You only get one life. And how are you living your life? Are you living your life for yourself? Or are you living your life for Jesus Christ? Extravagant acts of love will be remembered. Verses 6 through 9. Let's read verses 6 through 9. Jesus replied, leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She has done a noble thing for me. 
You always have the poor with you, and you can do what is good for them whenever you want. But you do not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body and advanced her burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. We read in Acts, in Acts chapter 7, verse 54 and 60, we have the record of the stoning of Stephen, the first Christian martyr. In verse 55 and 56, we read the most remarkable statement where Stephen sees the Lord Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And it's stated twice. Our Savior stands to receive his faithful martyred servant into glory. Think about what Stephen, Stephen did not care what people around him were thinking. He was just faithful to preach the word of God. He loved the people he was speaking to. And out of love, he was just telling them to repent and to put their faith and trust in Christ as the Messiah. Yet they did not like what they were hearing and they stoned him and killed him. Yet God received them into glory and was standing, he saw him standing there at the right hand of God. He sacrificed his life being faithful to what Christ had called him to do, which is to preach the gospel. Here in Mark chapter 14, verse 6, and now we see our Lord again standing up another, standing up for another faithful servant, a woman who has shown him with a sacrifice of extravagant love only to be scorned and ridiculed by those who should have known better. Jesus says, leave her alone in verse 6. Why do you trouble her? Why do you, why do you harass her? Why are you giving her a hard time? She has done a beautiful thing for me. She has done something wonderful and incredibly important to me, as in verse 8 makes it clear. Verse 7 has caused some readers real heartburn and trouble. They misread the verse, supposing Jesus to be somewhat callous, and insensitive towards the poor. The poor are always with us. In this fallen and broken world, and we can and we should do good for them. So Jesus is not saying, oh, I don't care about the poor. They're always going to be around. It's, he's not saying that. He's just making a true statement that we live in a fallen and broken world, and the poor will always be around. But we should still do good for them. Jesus believed that. Jesus taught that. The issue between always and not always. The poor are always there, but Jesus would not be. <coughs> the opportunity to show him this kind of personal love and affection would soon be gone. Further, we should not miss this. Jesus is God speaking and the first of the great commandments always trumps the second again jesus is god speaking and the first of the great commandments always trumps the second it does say right love god with all your heart mind soul and strength that's the first and greatest commandments to love god second is to love your neighbor as yourself so we got to put it in order sometimes people want to love people and god is second or even not even second, I don't know, he's down the list. And we put people before God, but it's supposed to be God and then people. Jesus indeed asserts his priority and preeminence above all things. Let's go to Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. Colossians 1, 18. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. So, Jesus is to have first place in everything in your life and in my life. He's to have priority and preeminence above all others. And this might help. Put these words in the mouth of any other human person and they sound scandalous. Self-centered, even narcissistic. Put them in the mouth of the Son of God who 
For this, for your sake became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Second Corinthians chapter eight verse nine. And they make all the sense in the world. Care for the poor, but worship the Savior. So we sometimes hear about social justice and doing good to others and feeding them with food. As we do here at our church, we have a homeless ministry. And yes, we are to do good deeds. We are to, you know, there's a saying that says, uh, preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. No, preach the gospel with words. The word of God, speak it unashamed, unapologetic. The word of God is powerful to Amen. save. Yes. But yet we still still do good. If we see someone who is hungry, we shouldn't ignore them or say, you know, or if they're uh, cold and they have nothing to wear, we shouldn't be like, oh yeah, we'll be praying for you. If we can do good for them by giving them food or giving them a blanket or some clothes or we can help them with their with their living situation, they're homeless and we can put them in a shelter or somewhere, we should do those things. We're called to do these things. Jesus healed the sick, right? He didn't just, he came primarily to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He came preaching the kingdom of God but yet he still healed people, fed people, did good to them, right? That's how we should do. We should care for the poor, but we should keep God first and worship the Savior. True love never calculates the cost. There's a saying that I love, that a quote that says, Love will find a way. Indifference will find an excuse. And true love never calculates the cost. Genuine devotion never considers the investment. It simply and spontaneously acts and does all that it can do. Disappointed only in the fact that it could not do more. Are we living like that for Christ, for Jesus? Are we like, I wish I could do more for him. I want to serve him in, any, in all areas of my life. I want to share my faith with my family, friends, co-workers. I want to feed the homeless. I want to just live sacrificially for Christ, for God, giving it all to Him because He gave it all for me on the cross. And next week is Easter, Resurrection Sunday. Christ died on the cross, but on the third day resurrected. And now we have hope that we will one day resurrect along with Him and be in heaven for all of eternity. Not because we're good, but because He's good and He loved us Amen. with the sacrificial love and giving his life for us on the cross. So this is exactly what we see in Mary. Jesus makes three striking observations about her in verse 8 and 9. Let's read verse 8 and 9. She had done what she could. She has anointed my body and advanced her burial. Truly I tell you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. First, she has done what she could. Obviously, God is not asking us to do something that we cannot do. She has done what she could. She held nothing back. Nothing. Are we holding anything back for God? Is it that we can do more for Him? Yeah, we choose not to. We choose to live just kind of in a kind of an easygoing kind of life. We don't want to just, we don't want to give God too much of our time or what we have to give. She held nothing back, nothing. Second, her act of extravagant love had prophetic and symbolic significance. She had anointed my body beforehand for burial. So Jesus is speaking about his, his burial right before he's even buried. Did she fully understand what was about to happen? Probably not. Did she have a greater insight into our Lord's coming passion than the 12 disciples? Oh, of this, I have little doubt. She had, think about this. The disciples were with Jesus for how long? About three years? And she, I don't know how long she was with them, but she had a, almost like a greater understanding of what was going to happen to Jesus than what his disciples were at that time. Third, Jesus makes a promise that her sacrifice of extravagant love will never be forgotten as the gospel advances among the nations throughout the whole world. Verse 9. The, world, the word truly or amen 
add a word of certainty to his promise. Everything that we do for Christ <coughs> will not go without being seen by God and being um, by He's gonna He's gonna give us what we He's gonna give us our due wages for what we do for Him, our crowns and not we don't do it because what we're gonna get from Him, but we do it because we love Him. But He will reckon uh, give us what we deserve. Um, so wherever the good news of salvation is proclaimed in the whole wide world, what this lady has done will be told again and again in memory of her. And the fact that I'm Sharing this story truly is a continuing validation of what Jesus had promised. The last point is verses 10 through 11. Extravagant love, acts of love, will stand in stark contrast to those of betrayal. Some people find Jesus useful because of what they think they can get from him. Sometimes... People come to church because they lost their job and they think that, oh, I'll come to church and God will bless me with a, another job, right? I've seen people do that. And once they get that job, they're out of the church. They no longer need Jesus. Or, I'm sick. I need to come to church so God can heal me. And God does heal. And he heals you. And then you go back out and go about your business. Or you're anxious, depressed. You come, you feel better, you have joy. All right, now I'm going back to what I used to do. A lot of times we come because we we need something from God. And we find Jesus useful for what we can get from him. But others find Jesus beautiful because they get him. God is the gospel. You get God. You get Jesus. You get to be in a relationship with your creator, with your maker. You become adopted as sons and daughters of God. And you get to share in that intimate relationship with him. Is that precious to you? Does that mean anything to you? If it doesn't, you should be concerned. If it does, you should be fostering, caring for that, growing that. That's why when we when we study the attributes of God, which is very important we do as Christians, we're, we're trying to understand who God is. We want to know His love, His justice, His holiness, His omniscience, His omnipresence. We want to know the character of who God is because we desire to know him. Like when you were in love, you were dating your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your wife or husband. You always every day are getting to know each other, right? And you hopefully want to continue to know each other and grow that love, that relationship. It should be the same between us and our God, our maker. We want to get to know him day by day, every more and more. And the more we know him, the more we worship him, the more we fall in love with him because of who he is. So finding Jesus beautiful because they get him, not because of what we can get from Jesus. This woman found Jesus beautiful and gave all that she had to him. In contrast, look at Judas. He found Jesus useful and sought to get all he could from him. So Judas wants to get what from, from Jesus and this woman gave all she had to Jesus. There's a difference there. The man, Judas Iscariot, Mark reminds us that was one of the 12. He was a disciple of Jesus, verse 10. Not surprisingly, he always, he's always last in all of the apostles. Was He was so close to Jesus, and yet he missed him. It could be in our churches today, in our church here, where just because you come to church and you sit in the pews doesn't mean you're saved and you're re regenerated and you have a relationship with God, a genuine, true relationship. You might just be like Judas sitting here. What, I, what can I get out of the church? What, what, uh, what programs does the church have for me and my family? Um, you guys have food? Oh, I'm hungry. I'm going to come and eat. Or whatever the case may be, you're always thinking of me, myself, what can I get? Instead of what can I do for God? What can I do for Jesus? Am I willing to disciple people? Am I willing to pray for people? Am I willing to evangelize, be missional? Am I willing to give to the cause of Christ financially or with our time? It costs something to follow Jesus. 
And that's one of the points here that, that, that uh, I hope you understand. That if you have a love for Jesus, it will not be that hard to do. You, would, you will want to do it. It's not that you have to do it. It's that you get to do it. Amazingly, he takes the initiative in going to the chief priest in order to betray Jesus in verse 10. Both Luke and John inform us that Satan moved in, moved him to betray the Lord. So Satan moved into Judas to betray him. But he still made his own decision and choice to betray the Son of God. Verse 11 is both simple and tragic all at once. <coughs> the leaders of the Sanhedrin were glad to hear this and promised Judas money. We're going to pay you, Judas, for what you're doing. Matthew informs us it was for 30 pieces of silver. The value of a slave accidentally gored to death by an ox. Jesus is lightly esteemed in refl his reflection, not only of his betrayal, but in the low sum agreed by Judas and the chief priest. So he sold them for very little. That's how much Judas did not care about Jesus. He sold them for very little. He didn't even get his money's worth. Judas then began to look for an opportunity to betray him, verse 11. It would come much sooner than he expected, but the results he would find deathly disappointing. What a contrast we see clearly in Mary and in Judas. A comparison is most inst instructive. Mary, I'm going to do a little quick comparison between Mary and Judas. Mary, a woman of no real standing, Judas was a man of one of the 12 apostles. She gave what she could for Jesus. He took what he could get from for Jesus. He blessed, she blessed the Lord. He betrayed his Lord. He loved her Lord. He used his Lord. He, she did a beautiful thing. He did a terrible thing. She served him as her savior. He sold him as he was his slave. Memorialize forever in her devotion. Memorialize forever in his betrayal. Who do you want to be like? Do you want to be like Mary or do you want to be like Judas? Obviously, we all want to be like Mary, right? Oh, how I want to be like Mary. But oh, how often it is that it is Judas who so readily appears. When I look in the mirror, only the gospel of my Savior is sufficient for my sin, sick soul. Because if it wasn't for the grace and mercy of our God, we would easily become like Judas in our self-centered, natural nature that we have. But when God regenerates and changes our lives, and God is sanctifying, working in our lives day by day, He's making us more like Mary, to love Jesus, to press, to, to have a, um, to really want to do what we can for devotion to God and for, and for what Jesus has done for us. So I want to conclude. And conclude. Uh, I strongly, I strongly suspect that. Were Mary, were Mary the unnamed woman of Mark 14 alive today and we were to interview her and ask her a question, what is your favorite Christian hymn? I strongly this actually would say that's easy. It's written in 1707 by Isaac Watts. Why Charles Wesley reportedly said he would give up all his other hymns to have written this one. Mr. Wesley wrote over 6,000 hymns to, know, to uh, you know. Some say he wrote over 9,000. Now the hymn written by Mr. Watts, When I Surveyed the Wondrous Cross. I'm going to read it to end the sermon. And it's very beautiful and it's very meaningful as we listen to it and I read it. When I survey the wondrous cross, which is next week is Resurrection Sunday. So let's meditate upon this. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. My riches gain I count but loss, and pour content on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. See, from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow to love flow mingled down. Dinner such love and sorrow meet, 
or thorns compose so rich a crown. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small. Love, so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Again, love, so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Let us have that attitude as followers of Jesus Christ. From here today forward, day by day, by His grace, by His mercy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks because, Lord, today is Psalm, uh, Palm Sunday, and this is a holy week, Lord. We know that next Sunday we will be celebrating Resurrection Sunday when Jesus defeated death, Satan, sin, and he's been victorious, and now we have the hope of being with you for all of eternity because, Lord, we are your sons and daughters, and we have repented of our sins, and we have put our faith and trust in Christ as Lord and Savior, and you have done a work in our hearts, and we have that joy that we will one day be with you for all of eternity. Let us live lives of sacrificial love towards you where, where, we're, where we would not say no to anything that you command us to do, Lord, for you. That we would love you, Lord, with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength and serve you in any way that we can to be obedient and to seek to honor you and glorify you, Lord, in all the things that we do in our lives, Lord. So help us, Lord. Give us much grace to do these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Uh, thank you. Pastor Kevin for that very timely message. Let us remember that the Word of God is relevant for every day and every one of our lives. So let us uh, rejoice in singing the last song, which is called Because Jesus Christ is Alive. We get tired, we can
Jesus Christ is alive. We're free to live for Jesus' faith. Because Jesus Christ is alive. By Christ's great mercy, we have been born again. Because Jesus Christ is alive. Our living home is in our inheritance. Because Jesus Christ is alive. turn to our Lord. Blessed God, we rejoice always in your word. We rejoice in your spirit that works within us, Lord. And we just ask you now, Father, that you may be with us, that you would settle these great teachings, Father, that are found in the Bible, Lord, that you would uh, allow us to be able to be fruitful, learning all the significant things, Father, that you have set before us. Indeed, your words are true bread to us, Lord. And we just ask you that you would be able to prepare for this week to glorify your name, to fear nothing, Lord, because we have you. And even if death was to come upon us, Lord, we know where we are going, Lord. We are in your hands, even now, and just ask you, Father, to be able to do the things, Father, that are necessary for our salvation, Lord, that you may continue to sanctify us and that we may rejoice in it, Father. That indeed, Father, we would glory in you, that we would cry out to you, Lord, as Jesus told the Pharisees who... He asked to rebuke his disciples when they were blessing his name as the Messiah. And he said if they were to remain silent, that the stones themselves would cry out, Lord. But there's no need for that, Father, for we ourselves with our own mouths can do this, Lord. And we do so with great love and with great honor to you. So I ask you to go with us, Father, to be with all the homes, Father, that are watching with us, that have indeed, Father, heard with their ears and speak in one voice with us, Lord. So I ask you to be with us to glorify yourself in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And for the benediction, I want to uh, go ahead and uh, read from Romans 15, which states the following. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And before uh, I uh, go ahead and uh, let us uh, go ahead, I want to mention that we do have a members meeting that is supposed to be a happening, and it will be happening online. So as soon as we have more information to give to you, especially those of you that are out there, we will go ahead and provide that. And we had uh, one more thing, brother, that you wanted to have me uh, point out. Hashtag. Okay. And we also have the hashtag Acts Reformed Church for those of you who are interested in following us as well. So the Lord bless you, brothers, and have a good week in the Lord. Amen. You are dismissed.